And now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the Ray Shasho Show, brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency. Each week, Ray spotlights in-depth interviews with legendary and -and up-and-coming authors and music artists. Ray also features the movers and the shakers of the music and publishing industries and suggests important methods for getting the most out of your public relations and marketing needs. Please welcome music journalist, author, and entrepreneur, Ray Shasho. Hello once again, everyone. I'm Ray Shasho, and welcome to the show where we interview legendary and up-and-coming music artists and authors. Brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency. Call us today at 941-877-1552 or email us at publicityworksagency.com. Remember, we shine only when we make you shine. Called an American treasure by the Los Angeles Times, brilliant by the London Times, a comic genius by Kirkus Reviews, and a true renaissance man by Newsweek, CBS, Sunday Morning, Playbill Magazine, and scores of other publications and websites, mystery novelist, playwright, composer, arranger, screenwriter, conductor, singer, songwriter, Rupert Holmes is the first person in theatrical history to solely win Tony Awards as an author, a composer, and a lyricist. His second Random House novel, Swing, reached the number 24 among all books at Amazon and was the first novel to come with an original CD musical score. His short stories have been anthologized in such prestigious collections as Best American Mystery Stories and On a Raven's Wing. In December of 2014, ASCAP presented Rupert Holmes with his prestigious George M. Cohen Award, acknowledged, acknowledging the diversity and depth of his career as a composer, lyricist, playwright, and novelist. For TV, Holmes created, wrote, and scored all four seasons of the critically hailed AMC series, Remember WENN, com, uh, commemorated on its 10th anniversary by cover piece in the Arts and Leisure section of the New York Times. I missed that show. He has arranged, conducted, and written platinum recordings for Barbara Streisand, including her lazy, classic Lazy a- uh, Afternoon album, and his songs for the Golden Globe, winning quadruple platinum billboard, number one LP score of uh, Star is Born. As a pop tunesmith, his work has been recorded by the leading vocalist of our time, from opera star Renee Fleming to pop star Britney Spears, from balladeer Barry Manilow to rapper Wyclef. Yet, despite all the above, Holmes is still best known to the public as the singer-songwriter of several Billboard Top Ten hits, including his number one multi-platinum smash, Escape, the Pina Colada song, heard in such recent films as Guardians of the Galaxy, The Secret Life of Walter Mitty, Grown Ups, Bewitched, Wanted with Angelina Jolie, The Sweetest Thing, Shrek, the TV shows Las Vegas, another good show I miss, True Blood, and most recently performed by Jimmy Holmes, uh, who went on to arrange and produce the talented uh, Brit rocker uh, John Miles. He, he went on to, to, to produce John Miles, resulting in the album Stranger in the City, and Zaragon and the single Slow Down, a number two dance hit on the U.S. Billboard Disco Charts, featuring memorable orchestration by Holmes. Other acts in Holmes, uh, producing repertoire at the time, were, were the glam rock band Sparks, the classic art rock band uh, Straws, The Straubs, and British pop singer-songwriter Lindsay DePaul. 1979 and 1980, with the release of his fifth album, Partners in Crime, uh, Holmes at last topped the Billboard charts as a singer, songwriter, arranger, and producer with his now iconic hit, Escape the Pina Colada Song, which went to number one in the United States, Canada, Australia, and Japan. Holmes followed Escape with the Billboard number six single, Him, and also penned the ballad, You Got It All Over Him, for the Jets. Uh, a record which simultaneously topped Billboard's top 40 R&B and adult contemporary charts in the number one, two, and three slots. 2015, he performed for the Library of Congress in concert with Steely Dan's Donald Fagan, uh, Natalie Merchant, rapper Neo, and John Legend. 
With the new millennium, Holmes added novel writing to his repertoire. His critically acclaimed mystery, Where the Truth Lies, was a bookless top ten uh, debut novel. His second, Swing, was a San Francisco Chronicle top ten best seller called Imaginative, Spart, Sophisticated, and Impressively Elaborate by Janet Maslin of the New York Times. His short stories have been anthologized in such prestigious collections as Best American Mystery Stories, On a Raven's Wing, A Merry Band of Murderers, and Christmas at the Mysterious Bookshop. He was also commissioned by the New York Times to write the Arts and Leisure Tribute, celebrating the 100th birthday of Irving Berlin. Holmes is currently finishing the first uh, entry in a new fictional mystery series for Simon & Schuster. Holmes is currently completing the first book in a new series for Simon & Schuster, The McMaster's Guide to Homicide, Murder Your Employer. Please welcome a true renaissance man of the 21st century, Rupert Holmes of the Ray Shasho Show. Hello, Rupert. Hello there, Ray. I missed some of that. Could you just repeat it? Okay, let's see. Um, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I don't think I can repeat it if I tried. <laughs> no, I have to. I, I'm, I regret to inform you, Ray, that I passed away during that intro. <laughs> uh, I think most of my audience, too. <laughs> I know, I know, I know, I know. It's, um, but I've been miraculously resuscitated just for the benefit of this, uh, this interview. So let's make the most of it. Well, I appreciate that. <laughs> You know, you've done so much in your career. M- many people I'm don't really... know that unless you unless you really dive into it and, and, and do your research. I mean, y- you are a true Renaissance man. Um, which probably means I'm mainly that I'm I feel as old as Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci. Um, the uh, yeah, it's 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 funny um, sometimes. For example, when my first novel came out, um, someone in the Florida area reviewed it. And said uh, something like, "Yeah, Pina Colada wrote a novel," and oh, not, not being aware that I had written eight Broadway shows in the right. intervening years, that I, you know, yep. uh, people are always. I, I, and sometimes I will read things that the saying, uh, "Yeah, okay, about this guy, but what? Uh, what where's the guy that wrote the Pina Colada song? What's what? <laughs> the, they both have the same name, or what is that?" So it's um, um, it's it's interesting. It's been a busy career. Uh, when you read off what I've done. It exhausts me. I must be very <laughs> tired. I, I'm surprised I could even uh, uh, conduct this interview. But uh, let's try. Well, you know what? There was more, but I, I, I just couldn't fit it all in. No, you, <laughs> no, no. There, could, there couldn't be more. You, you know, I think you left out my ninth birthday. I think you left okay. out my American Flyer. Tra- you didn't mention my American Flyer train set. <laughs> and, uh, and also that I'm a, uh, you know, a, bro- a winner of the bronze medal in, in the javelin throw. <laughs> uh, but uh, but beyond that, I think you covered everything, you know? Awesome. Uh, so I awesome. appreciate that. I appreciate that. Well, first thing I want to talk about, you know, uh, Rupert Holmes' Songs That Sound Like Movies, the complete epic recordings. It's a three-CD remastered edition, a box set. I gave it five stars, man. It, it, is, it is some great music, and a lot of it before... Uh, I guess it was in your epic years before Pina yes, Colada came out and, and all the hits came out. And it's, it's an incredible, uh, you know, every song to me, every track is like its own mini movie. It's awesome. That's very kind of you. First of all, I appreciate the five-star rating. Please don't tell me that you rate on a scale of 20 stars. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I, I appreciate that greatly. And... Um, and yeah, the the set songs that sound like movies. It's on uh, Cherry Red. Um, right. It co- covers all of uh, all of my work for my first for the first label that I recorded for Epic Records. And it's it's kind of an interesting collection because it was the most intense version of what I was trying to do at that time. I mm-hmm. I really when I, particularly when I made my first album Widescreen, which is included uh, with right. the, uh, the set. Um, you know, I never knew if I would be making a second album. I didn't know that I would go on to make eight. But but when I made that first album, I thought I'd better put everything I've ever wanted to get onto a onto a record uh, on this album. And um, and the amazing part of it was that because it was so intense and each cut was very different, each song that I wrote, not only the songs were different, but 
but the, the arrangements, I had a different um, instrumentation for every band on the album. I did all my, I always do my own orchestrations, my own arrangements, mm -hmm. and, and instead of like finding the band for the album and then adding strings to all the tunes, each song got its own dedicated treatment. And uh, because of that, um, it, it's one of the reasons that Barbara Streisand was taken to it when she, when she heard the album, when it first came out, and asked me to write for her and arrange for her, and we started collaborating at that time, right on the heels of that first album. But the CD, the song, uh, the, the CD set covers my my first three albums, and then the usual um, bonus cuts that you can expect, things that we didn't put on those first three albums, and also uh, some of the songs from those first three albums in the only live recordings that I've ever released. Um, around the time of, of those albums. So you can actually hear uh, what it would have been like to go to a small club in those days and hear me sing some of these songs from these albums. It's uh, never done it. It was the, the Cherry Red, the label that put it out, really encouraged me to uh, find a couple of live recordings. So not in awesome fidelity, but they're, they're good enough. And, and uh, you can really get the feeling of sitting in a club like The Bottom Line or The Bijou mm -hmm. in Philadelphia and and right. hearing me when I was just starting out. Well, some of my favorite tracks on that, I, you know, I love Terminal. You know, that, that's such mm -hmm. a, you know, you can pic picture that song in your head and create a, mm -hmm. a movie or a story along with your story. Talk, another excellent, excellent song. A National Pastime, which was really co cool. You know, yeah. I'm a baseball lover, so I, I really enjoyed that. Yeah. Uh, Letters that cross in the mail, another one. Touch and go, and weekend lover. Those are those, those are my favorite tracks that I got out of it. Anyway, well, those are all particular favorites of mine, and yeah. and you, the way you, the way you describe it um, is is pretty accurate. This was mm -hmm. these songs were written and recorded before there was ever a thing such as a music video, right? And actually, actually, what drew me to making records the way I did was the exact opposite of music videos. It mm -hmm. was that I wanted the, the, the audio track, the sound that you heard in that record, the instrumentation, even sometimes sound effects and dialogue within right. the record itself, the, the song. I wanted them to draw you as the listener in. I wanted to have the same effect that you had. I'm, I'm, although I'm not young by any means, I am too young still to have actually been around for the golden age of radio, you know, the shadow and yep. radio shows like that, Superman on the radio. Mm -hmm. uh, but... But but I I always uh, uh, on a delay as I discovered the world of uh, of old time radio I was fascinated by the fact that three people sitting by a radio envisioning the st the story that's being presented mm -hmm. on the radio would all envision different things and it would be uniquely your own record so yeah just to take my one of my probably the most the best known uh, lyric of, that I've written on the Pina Colada song when I say that. Um, the hero is going to, or not the hero, but the protagonist of the song is going to go to a bar called O'Malley's. Well, we all mm -hmm. have our own idea of what a right. bar called O'Malley's looks like. And the yep. second you start populating the song with your own set decoration and your own, and your own, and, and you picture the, the hero and the heroine the way you would have them be, it becomes your video in your mind, it becomes your song, and, and your attachment to the tune uh, is closer. You become the virtual director of cinematography for a movie that I'm spinning, a three and a half minute movie. And and so when you described about being able to visualize a, a song like Terminal, which is uh, one, one of the earliest mm -hmm. cuts on the album, um, that 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 was indeed the the entire point. And on our national pastime, um, which again I'm a baseball lover as well, Ray, and uh, mm -hmm. um, I thought it would be fun to write a tune about a guy trying to uh, pick up a girl at a Mets baseball game. Um, and as they start to play the Star Spangled Banner, he starts trying to sing a song that would seduce her to that tune. So I did this kind of reggae arrangement of, mm -hmm. of the Star Spangled Banner. And when I got to the section where normally you would expect there to be a tenor sax solo or a guitar solo or something like that, I thought, no, let's hear what these two... Um, th these two hapless characters have to say to each other. And so instead of going into a tenor sax solo, I started speaking to the girl in, you'd envision in the song, and a wonderful actress named Alice Platon, 
uh, did the dialogue with me, and, and so we had our own little exchange, a little scene within this three-minute record. And there were sound effects of the ballpark and the sound of Ron Swoboda hitting a deep pop fly out to left field. And, uh, um, and, and it was an attempt to try to bring to life in every way that I could uh, the story of this one particular song in a way that would cause you to envision, um, he says, how do you like my pad? She says, oh, I, I love purple. And now you instantly are seeing this pad in your mind, you know, this, 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 his purple pad. So um, it, that was the point of it all. And uh, that's, I guess, why uh, Cherry Red did, opted to call the, um, the, the collection Songs That Sound Like Movies, because that was always sort of the goal. You know, there's not enough of that today in today's music, you know, a story in the music. Now, I miss guys like, you know, like you and, and Harry Chapin. You know, I loved Harry Chapin. Uh, yep. I, I've, I've, inter I've interviewed uh, Tom Rush, and I told Tom, you know, there's nothing like a guy up sta uh, on stage alone with a guitar and a, and a song and a story. I mean, you know, that to me, that's everything right there. And I, I, I just love Absolutely. stories and songs, you know. Coinc coincidentally, I, I actually got to um, arrange, uh, orchestrate an album for Tom Rush um, in Good sort guy. of the same period. I did. Yeah. Uh, the album was called Ladies Love Outlaws. Mm -hmm. And uh, I actually am the backup. I am the full backup vocal, uh, vocal section, uh, all in falsetto of, of the lead-off cut on the album, Ladies Love Outlaws. Oh, really? If you ever listen to it, that's, you listen oh. to it and you'll hear me in falsetto being the, uh, the backup vocals. But on that album, he did a song called Desperados, Waiting for a Train. Right. About right. Himself and his grandfather. And I got to write the, these strings on it. And, yeah, it's a little... So you can really picture the the granddad and his grandson and playing cowboys and pretending to be train robbers and it's just a lo lovely visual. It's amazing. Do you ever have it, Ray, where you you picture some place in your mind and you actually start to say to yourself, "Is that somewhere I really went? Yep. Or is that a location I saw in a movie? Or is that something I dreamed?" Or is that something I read in a book, and that's what I envisioned at that time? It could be yeah, any one of those four things. Yeah. Some of the most, the some of the most beautiful, some of the most beautiful settings and landscapes that I've pictured mm -hmm. are I never saw. I just saw them in my mind. Uh, on that mm -hmm. that song, Desperados, I can I, I, I right now I can picture it, and I can see the the, the canyon country, and and uh, and it's very vivid. And yet I never saw it with my eyes, only with my mind and my ears. I'm, I'm surprised. I'm surprised you're not also a uh, an artist painting. Do you, do you do any painting? You know, um, I, I, have you ever seen the Sistine Chapel, the ceiling there? Yeah, sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that uh, was I you. Took a photograph <laughs> of that. I took a I took a I took a photograph of that once. You know what's funny about me? <laughs> around around ten years of age, I mastered drawing a a guy, mm -hmm. like a cartoon figure holding a mm -hmm. sign that I could then label. And I also learned via TV how to draw Woody Woodpecker. Really? Uh, Walter Lance, <laughs> the, the, the animator Walter Lance was, had a, hosted a, a, a Woody Woodpecker cartoon show. I don't even know if your listeners will even know who Woody was. But um, uh, I mastered drawing Woody Woodpecker, and I mastered drawing a cartoon guy holding a little sign. And I have never, my artwork has never improved from that day on. <laughs> I... I, but if you need Woody Woodpecker in a hurry, on, on demand, I can, on demand, they can draw it. Nothing else. Nothing else. I, whatever, whatever creative talent I had, someone said, uh, as God was loading me up, they said, okay, so he's got music, he's got storytelling, he's got rhyme schemes, he's got mysteries. Uh, and someone called, God, what do you want to do? And just as I was supposed to get some artistic sense, uh, God turned his back and empty. <laughs> Zero. Zilch. I was well, never we so can't do it all. The the camera. Yeah, no, you can't do not. it all. It's just <laughs> impossible. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> in, in, in an interview you did, you were talking about Baghdad. Uh, I think you said it was about death and the idea that l love can survive. Uh, and you said you wished you used more Arabian Night orchestration and dreamy background voices, but you used up all your money on psychodrama. <laughs> yeah, I did. I did. Uh, we, we had, um, we were given, and, uh, you know, by today's standard, this may actually sound like a good budget. 
Uh, but in the days when you had to pay every musician on your sessions right. and studio time, and when your laptop wasn't also your recording studio, exactly. when, you didn't have pro, when you didn't have Pro Tools, you had to go to a place, and it would be $200 an hour, and it would take days and mo- weeks and months to do an album. So we had $25,000 to record my first album. That was not a big budget. Uh, it, it, uh, in the, in those days, uh, for a mm-hmm. full album, especially one that was going to be heavily orchestrated. My first album alone, widescreen, had 56 musicians. It had 10 actors. Um, it had all kinds of special effects. We recorded one of the songs just for the last um, 20, 30 seconds of a song called Second Saxophone. We did a remote recording on the sidewalk of 57th and 8th Avenue where I was playing saxophone and asking people to throw coins in a cup because that was the logical outcome of the story about the sax player who I was portraying in that one tune. We didn't have a lot of money, and we plowed everything that we had into the album. Uh, we didn't, I didn't take a penny for the arrangements, even though I had to be paid through the union, but I just, when I got the check, I just put it back into the budget. And we had to pay for union engineers at that time. You couldn't just operate with, the, with your own engineer. You had to have a CBS recording engineer either with you or you had to record at CBS Studios. And, uh, and eventually, um, in those days, if you wanted 56 musicians and you were going to take five months to record an album, not because you were lazy, but because you were meticulous, and you had to hire actors out of uh, AFTRA to, to, to record on the session, um, that 25000 went very, very fast. Yep. And uh, towards the end, the last two cuts um, that we did, Baghdad, I could only sort of create some of the Arabian Nights sounds that I wanted, doing it by miking um, a Hammond work in unusual ways and also putting some drum, r- repeating drum reverb on, on, on tom-toms that were being played by mallets mm-hmm. and also doing some kind of distant background vocals and then when we got to the final cut letters that crossed in the mail we had no money so i had to, i decided that what this song called out for was me on a piano singing uh but what we did to make it unusual is we did um a again we were always looking for audio equivalents of cinematic effects so right. we wanted to create the we wanted to create the the audio equivalent of a tracking shot and that's when mm-hmm. that's that scene in a movie where a so you start the scene widescreen, and you see this huge panorama, and slowly you move in closer and closer until finally you're focused on one person in the crowd, or right. the inverse of that, where you start with two people, and then you pull back and you pull back. That's the way most movies end, pulling back, pulling back, pulling back, and you see the person going over the canyon, and now you see the whole valley, and that's the end. Uh, so what we did is we set up uh, my, my uh, producing partner, uh, Jeffrey Lesser, who was also a brilliant engineer, he put mm-hmm. two microphones in the piano, two just slightly above them. He put two five feet above them, two ten feet above them. Then he put two six feet behind them and then put some that went out into the hallway of CBS Recording Studios and then some that went all the way down to the elevator bank. And I started huh. playing, and he slowly panned from the most distant pair of microphones, slowly moving closer and closer to me, always in stereo, until finally you were virtually inside the piano and then I could sing on the vocal mic in front of me, and at least gave that, gave it a, a, a some kind of uh, cinematic feel to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and Streisand eventually, when she heard the cut, she said, I want to record that. And so uh, on her album Lazy Afternoon, which I arranged and conducted, um, right. we did that song among the many that I wrote, and I got to write for her the big orchestration that I had run out of money for myself. So I've I've got I've got my version with just solo piano, and I've got her version with a lush orchestra. So I've had it both ways there. Well, I, I love the early, I love the early days when you improvise like that. I remember on Dark Side of the Moon and all the stuff they did on on that album. You know, and and you can't you can't repeat that today. You know, with all the technology you have, it, 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 there's something magic. Even about the '60s and and those '45 and those you know the Echoplex and the recordings. Of, of sure. a 40, 45 record, you, can, you just can't master that anymore. It's not the same, you know. You know, it, it's when you can, when you have the tech, technical ability to achieve perfection, uh, it takes some of the fun out of it. It does. A lot of things that I, a lot of things that I've done in my life were 
a combination of that moment and a feeling in the room and a, something that went wrong, and we combined. Right, I did one cu- I, Yeah. On my fourth album, I, I did a cut called Guitars, and I hired every guitar player I had ever worked with in New York City on the session. It was like 25 acoustic guitars. Really? And I didn't tell anyone. I was, <laughs> yeah. I didn't tell, and it was everybody from the old timers to the new people. There was uh-huh. there was um, uh, Vinnie Bell who did the love theme from Airport and Tony Matola, and yet wow. there was also Elliot Rand Elliot Randall who played on uh, Steely Dan's Reeling in the Years and Jay sure. Berliner and Sal Detroit who played the lick that you can never forget from Everybody's Talking. Dun 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 dun. dun yeah, oh yeah. Dun, 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 dun. Every guitar player I'd ever worked with, and I didn't tell anyone. Right that I had hired, like, 20-plus guitars. Um, and one guitar player came in, and there was a second guitar player, and he, they, they knew each other. The third guitar player walked in and said, oh, you got three guitars on this date, huh? And I smiled. And a fourth comes in, and a seventh, and a ninth, and the fifteenth, and it was, it was fun. We got in a horseshoe shape to play this one cut, and mm-hmm. I was conducting it, so I was right at the center of this horseshoe. And you're talking about 25 acoustic guitars, no amps, nothing, just microphones wow. and guitars. And they strummed this one big chord, and uh, as close as dying and going to heaven within my lifetime, what that mm-hmm. sounded like. I did one take, and the engineer said, okay, let's do a second take. I said, no. This, this, <laughs> it'll never be better than this. It'll never be and better. The guy right. said, the guy said, can't we play yesterday something? <laughs> can't, we, can't we record, you know, you know, I want to hold your hand? we got 25 <laughs> guitars here. Said, no, this is perfect. This is perfect, just as it is. Yeah. And you're saying, you can go home so, now. <laughs> can, yeah. And uh, by the way, a lot of wonderful hits from the 60s, 50s, late 50s, and into the 60s, um, they were mixed in mono. Mm-hmm. And years later... Um, because they were big hits, they would be re-released in stereo. Yep. And sometimes that's, a, sometimes that's a wonderful thing. But sometimes when you would remix the record for stereo, I, n- this never happened in any of my recordings. Mine were all done in stereo initially. But mm-hmm. some of those Four Seasons records, they don't sound exactly. the same in stereo. Exactly. The, 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 You're 100% the, right. The, the, yep. squash and the, the squash and the compression and the... Yep. The balance of, of sound in, uh, in that mono track. And you some, sometimes you'll hear a record and say, gee, I remember it being a lot more powerful, a lot more solid, a lot more, it had a better beat. And you well, wonder even, why. Even the Beatles you're... records, you know, even yeah. the Beatles yeah. 45s were much better back then. Yeah. You, yeah. It only makes you, it makes you marvel at, at George Martin and, and oh, the, yeah. things that he commi- the things that he committed to in those mixes, four track, where you had to decide from the outset what the entire rhythm section mm-hmm. would sound like, and it could never be remixed. Uh, just just amazing what, what that man did. I, I talked recently to Mason Williams. A lot of people haven't talked with him in a long time, you know, the classical mm-hmm. gas guy. Classical gas, of you, course. Sure. Yeah, that was pretty cool talking with him. You know, speaking of wasn't the 60s he, and all that. Wa- wasn't Mason Williams also a writer on the Smothers Brothers show? I oh, think? yeah, yeah, he was a comedy writer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Maybe. He's a funny guy like you. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of 45s in the 60s and everything, how about Jennifer Tompkins? Jennifer Tompkins, yes. My <laughs> theory on Jennifer Tompkins, it, that record ran 1 minute and 58 seconds, and by the way, it was about a 30-second fade. So right. including the, not counting the 30-second fade, and as you know, in radio in those days, you could leave a record right on a fade. Well, once yep. the record started fading, you you could go seventy-seven WABC. Yes, and what was it? There you go. Okay. Right. So, so my theory was that one of the appeals of that record, Jennifer Tompkins, was that it ran. It, you could get out of that record by one minute and twenty seconds in. So, if a DJ was looking up at the clock and he was two minutes away from the news, uh, mm-hmm. put on Jennifer Tompkins and uh, <laughs> just talk over the. Talk over the fade out. Oh, okay, we're going to be going to news, and when we come back, we're going to have a great new hit by Dion Willard. Um, so, so the the history of that. Do you want to get into it? The history of that record is ridiculous. Well, I know. Uh, or what's his name? The guy from the Archies, Dante, uh, was yeah, kind of I, involved. The, Go yeah, ahead. The, I'll, the, I'll let you say. The, no, it's okay. I don't mean to talk over you here, but um, but the truth of the matter is, I read accounts of how that record came into existence. Uh-huh. Um, and and lots of people have lots of parts of the story right. 
but no right. one has it completely right. So I'll give you the official official version. This is you heard it right here. I, yep, this is the way it happened, and and I know because I wrote the song, I right. arranged the song, I played the song, and I sang the song. So okay. if anyone if anyone thinks they know more about it than me, and I think Paul Vance is in Florida, the guy who I wrote it with. So if he's mm -hmm. listening, I'm taking him down memory lane as well. Okay. So um, in those days, I used to write. I was struggling. This was long before any of my first recordings uh, as myself, uh, and long before this stuff on the on songs that sound like movies. I was just trying mm -hmm. to to earn a living in the business and, and try to hang in there. It might have been right. 69 or, or 1970, and um, and there was a a, a really well-established songwriter named Paul Vance, who usually wrote with a guy named Lee Pockris, and both mm -hmm. of them very good songwriters. And to their credit, they wrote uh, Catch a Falling Star and Put It in Your Pocket. Sure. Uh, yep. And uh, Playground in My Mind. And uh, uh, the, and then on the other side, they wrote Leader of the Laundromat, which was a parody song uh, sending up a leader of the pack. Okay. Um, and uh, I think they also wrote Itsy Bitsy Teeny Weeny Yellow Polka Dot Bikini as well. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, I was young, hungry, and desperate for any job anyone would give me in the business. And so I, Paul found out that I was willing to um, help him write songs by sitting at the piano and putting chords to it and figuring out how it might go. He didn't read music and couldn't write it. So he always needed someone who could sit at a piano with him. And uh, I was okay at lyrics. And I was very young. I may have been 20 at the time. Um, and I could arrange. I could notate music and knew how to write for rhythm instruments and some strings and brass. And so he, he I, one day I overheard him talking to a friend. And he said, I got this kid, you see. And uh, what he does is he writes the songs with me. He writes them all down. He does the lead sheets for copyright purpose. Then he arranges the thing. He writes out all the parts. I don't hire a copyist. He does all his own copying. And he, he writes all the parts. He conducts a session. He plays keyboards on the session. Then he sings all the background vocals if I need it. And if I need a lead mm -hmm. vocal and it'll work out for a guy, he sings it. And I can even get him to stand on a milk crate and slam his feet on four, four beats to the bar, every bar, <laughs> to add to the to until his ankles are swollen. And I pay him, you won't believe it, I pay him 30 bucks a song to do this. Wow. Flat out. And wow. I heard that and I thought, he's paying me 30 bucks a song, and I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Meaning, <laughs> I'm getting the world's best education, and it's only yep. cost, and I'm making $30 a song to learn how to be in the music business. Anyway, one, of the t one day he came in and he said, uh, got to write a song about bubblegum. Got to write a song about bubblegum. Bubblegum is a big thing. Uh, I had <laughs> sort of noticed this already um, uh, because we had songs like Yummy, 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 I've Got Love in My Tummy right. and One, Two, Three, yep. Red Light, mostly by Kaznitz and Katz on, the, on, uh, on Buddha Records. And uh, he said, we're going to write a song. It's going to be called Bubblegum Has Come to Town. So I help him write this song, and it's got a, a wonderful uh, chorus, Ray, that I'm so proud of, to have written. It went... Uh, Hop, skip, jump around, bubble gum has come to town. Look, look, everywhere. <laughs> so that's how it went. And for a, and for a, so I wrote the arrangement. I played piano. I played organ as an overdub. Uh, and in to sing it came one of the most talented men in the business at that time or any time, a guy named Ron Dante. And yep. your listeners know the voice of Ron Dante very well without necessarily knowing who he is. He was the lead yep. singer on Sugar Sugar by the Archies yeah, sure. and other Archies yeah. hits, right? Yep. He was, while he had the number one record in the United States singing lead on Sugar Sugar, he also had the number six record in the United States singing the lead on Tracy by the Cufflinks. So he mm -hmm. was the Archies and he was the voice of the Cufflinks. There were no Cufflinks. There was no such group. Any more than a cartoon strip can have a group. It was studio right. musicians and session singers. Well, Ron Dante was supposed to come in and sing Bubblegum Has Come to Town. And we're waiting for Ron to arrive. And Paul Vance gets a call saying, Ron can't come in and do it. Uh, Don Kirshner has told him he can't be making any more records as anything other than the Archies, because they're a big, huge, established, not, I, I can't say group with a straight face, because there was no group, but they were <laughs> yeah. a recording name. 
you know. Right. Uh, right. And, and Kirshner said, uh, had told Ron, you're going to be the Archies, we're going to develop the Archies into a real band, you'll front the band, you're going to be Archie, and, uh, and then we'll go on and you'll record under your own name, Ron Dutton. So Ron didn't show up for the date. Well, in those days, you're sitting there, the studio time is ticking away. We were Groove Sound, Groove Sound, uh, an 8-track studio on 55th, between 8th and 9th. Um, our engineer, I think, was Wiley C. Brooks or Steve Jerome, one of the two. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, so we didn't have a vocalist. So Paul looked at me and said, you know how the tune goes, right? I can't go out there. I'm 47 years old. I said, sure, I know the tune. He said, well, you, you sing it. So I go on mic, and I had had a little asthma uh, or something, and I was kind of wheezing a bit, and I was also trying to make myself sound really young. Right? Mm -hmm. I was trying to be really. So I'm going, Bubble Gum's all good. It's got the power from dancing and loving from hour to hour. So I'm seeing it like that. Right. And the uh, record is made. It's called Bubble Gum has Come to Town. Music or Records is, purchases it. And they decide the name of the group. There is no group. We'll be the street people. Mm -hmm. um, and Ron Dante agrees to sing the backup vocals on the cut. As long as he's not the lead singer, he's okay. So he comes gotcha. on and does, sings harmony to me, who's the right. co-writer and arranger. About a week later, Paul Vance calls me in, and he's panicked. He says, the head of, our talent, the head of musical records, says, bubblegum is over, not meaning that the music is over, but, but the term bubblegum is, is poison. Okay. Kids don't like being, t kids are no longer liking being told that their music is bubblegum music. You can't right. make any reference to bubblegum. So he said, so we're going to have to re-record the tune. Now, does that mean we would re-record it from track, of, uh, from scratch? No, of course not. What it means is that we would have to write a new, take the vocal line that existed for bubblegum has come to town, write a new lyric to it, and logically I would go back in and record it again. Paul loved to write songs about poor white trash. I don't know why he was obsessed with this. <laughs> so he writes this. So he comes up with an angle on it. I helped him a little with the lyrics, but it's mainly his point of view. And he writes this sob story about a, a girl who, you know, uh, Jennifer Tompkins was born on a Sunday. Her daddy got drunk and went home on a Monday. Her mother, she died young when Jenny was seven. And Jennifer Tompkins went to work at 11. I mean, this girl should have been, you know, there are child labor laws and stuff. But anyway, <laughs> that's the song. So I now go back into the studio, same track uh, that I recorded for Bubblegum has come to town. And uh, I start to sing it, and I'm trying to, again, yeah, I don't, I'm, now I don't have asthma anymore, but I'm trying to sound a little like that. Mm -hmm. That voice seemed to work okay. So I'm going, mm -hmm. Jennifer Tompkins was born on a Sunday, her daddy got, like that. And that kind of very mm -hmm. younger than I was, even though I was only like 20 or 21 at the time. I'm trying to right. sound 16, 17. <laughs> we make the record, and um, the background vocals that Ron Dante recorded won't work because he's singing the lyrics to Bubblegum Has Come to Town as background. Right. So we hire one of the best gospel singers in the history of gospel singing, Tasha Thomas, who had a number mm. of records of her own. And um, a, fellow, a fellow named, I believe, Carl Perkins, who sang in a falsetto that sounded like a girl, and they sing the background vocals to this new lyric of Jennifer Tompkins. I'm mm -hmm. singing the lead. They, we mix it. It gets released as the street people. And it goes to, like, in some parts of the country, it goes top 10. Mainly yep. it goes to maybe 30 somewhere, 30-something on the charts, maybe 38, I don't know, on Billboard. It has always been my theory, as I just told you, that the reason it was played at all was because it was so short that you could always squeeze it in just before you went to news. That's always True. been my theory. And True. what happened was be because the record went top 40, it made people think, I guess this Rupert Holmes can, is a studio singer who can sing records. Uh, it was my first hit as a vocalist, first record at least mm. chart in Billboard as a vocalist, and it started getting me work uh, yep. doing uh, studio groups for other people, including replacing Ron Dante as the couplings when Ron Dante said, I can't do the couplings anymore either. I gotta, yeah. I'm only doing the Archies. So that really got me into the idea of I can be a vocalist on records that for mm -hmm. groups that don't exist. And it was making those kind of... One, uh, Epic Records came to me and said, we want you to do one of those groups for us. And I was going to record as Rosebud. 
And I suddenly sat there at home one day and thought, I have yet to, I, I'm busy in the business. I'm barely making a living, but I'm in it. But if I don't record something soon that is actually something I've created that represents what I b- think a song might be about, what yep. uh, I, I'm going to hate myself. And mm-hmm. I, I took a song called Terminal that I'd just written about four months earlier. It was yep. not with a group vocal. It was not designed to sound like anything other than a singer-songwriter singing a story song. Right. And I put it on the, on the session when Epic was really expecting, I don't know what, Cufflinks records or something, I don't know. And I knew that there was a chance they would hand me my head because I was not giving them what they had paid me to give them. Right. I was giving them. Yeah. And instead, it was the gamble that, that changed my life because yep. they came back and said, what, what you've done here um, is not a, you know, a non-existent group. This is a guy... You're a singer-songwriter, and we want to put this out as Rupert Holmes, and that led to my getting the first mm-hmm. of the, making the first of my three albums for Epic, um, all based on that transition from being an anonymous studio musician uh, and vocalist to being um, a singer-songwriter yep. who would record songs that he wrote himself. A great story. That is a great story. You know, Sugar Sugar was actually offered to the Monkees by Don Kirshner, but they turned it down. Uh, I never knew want, that. That's is yeah, that the true? Monkeys, wow. That is, yeah, the monkeys wanted to do their own thing at that time, and they were sick and tired of uh, not being able to record and, and, and write their own music and play their own instruments, and that's when they got into Head, that album. But it was a big wow. mistake because they lost all their popularity, and they could have kept on it. They could have made a fortune with Sugar Sugar, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, You're right. I, I didn't know that. I didn't know that yeah. song was up for grabs at that point. Wow. I I admired I admired Don Kirshner a lot. I mean, he you know he was a you know he he knew good music you know which was very very important, and uh, he 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 uh, he respected the music. You know, he wasn't just a money guy. I think he he enjoyed the music and he believed in the music, and uh, he, he yeah, did well, a good I, job. I think. I, I, I agree with you. However, I, I did do appear on Don Kirshner's rock concerts at least three or four times, and mm-hmm. that show would record over the course of about nine hours. And right. one time, I, it was, I'd been sitting there since like 8, and it was now 3 a.m., and we had yet to go on. Is that right? And I said, huh. I said to somebody, could you, where's Don? Can I speak to Don for a second? <laughs> Where's, where's Don? Don's here, isn't he? He's, he's, he hangs around. I mean, it is his rock concert. No, no. Don never... You know, Don would show up one day in the studio and tape all the intros to all the artists that were on all the shit. So he'd stand yeah. and say, next, we have a wonderful... You know. But um, yeah. at, at 3 a.m., I couldn't find Don Kirshner to save my life. <laughs> I heard stories about the Midnight Special, too. That uh, I think you, you did the Midnight Special, right? Wasn't there oh, like... Uh, People sitting on the floor, yeah. and it was like, it was well, it, very strange. All of right? these shows, all of these shows were very strange. Um, yeah, I would do, I would do solid gold, and literally there would be no one in the audience. They'd shoot, <laughs> or they'd put, or they'd put three people who were in charge of makeup, and they'd make them sit in the front row and shoot over their heads. That doesn't mean, by the way, that all of those shows did that. The funniest yeah. thing that happened with me in Solid Gold and Midnight Special was uh, this. One day, Solid Gold said to me, we want you to come uh, to L.A. and we want to film you singing six of your tunes. Mm-hmm. And I thought, wow, six tunes on the show is only an hour. This is going to end up being like a, a Rupert Holmes special. That's kind of marvelous. <laughs> so prior to doing that show, Barry Manilow had seen me at the bottom line. and He, said to, he sent me a note saying, Rupert, always wear a white suit. It never fails. So, you know, who was, I to, who was I to question Barry? And so I got myself a white linen suit, very nice suit, and a kind of turquoise blue shirt to go with it. And I go on to Solid Gold, and, and I film six songs from my album, wow. Partners in Crime. And I'm thinking, this is fantastic. I mean, I can't wait to see this show. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so I, I tune in like about four weeks later, because it was shot and then aired on a delay. And uh, Dion War Dion War War was was hosting, and um, okay, and she says, "Please welcome to our show with this hit song, Escape the Pina Colada, Rupert Holmes." And then they show me singing the song, 
And I think, okay, that's great. I can't wait to see the five other songs and all like that. There are no more other songs. It's, they don't no show idea. any of the other songs I recorded. Mm -hmm. And I think, well, I wonder what that's all about. Two weeks later, I tune in, wondering what's going on. Dionne Warwick says, back with us again is Rupert Holmes to sing his <laughs> song, Him. Uh, please welcome Rupert. Okay. That's it. Okay. And then one song. Then two weeks later, it, they, she says, please welcome a frequent visitor to our show, Rupert Holmes. He's going to sing <laughs> Answer. Now, that's Ray, funny. that's not the important part of this story. What's important is this. I was wearing the same white suit for six <laughs> times. That's great. <laughs> so for the course of a year, it looked like the only thing I owned was this one white suit. That's funny. And it was That's embarrassing. Hilarious. People thought, God, this guy is really working the white suit really hard, isn't he? So yeah. then I go to Midnight, Spe I go to Midnight Special, <laughs> and I'm co-hosting I'm, I'm co Midnight Special with the Village People. Right. And I've, oh no, sorry, I got it wrong. I did once co host with the Village People, but this time around I was co hosting with Janice Ian. Yep. And I had learned my lesson. I was not going to wear the same outfit. They said, We want you to record four songs. So oh, I did no. one song, did Escape. And they said, Okay, we'll do the next one now. And I said, uh, No, just hold on one second, I got to change. So I went and changed into something rustic <laughs> and all like that. And I said, Come on, I do that song. Then they say, okay, another. I said, just once I just get two minutes, I promise you, two minutes. I go off, I come back on. Everyone's looking at me like I'm in a new outfit. And there's one, because I had learned my lesson. I didn't want to look stupid. Well, of course, when That's Midnight funny. Special aired, when Midnight Special aired, all four songs were in that one episode. So it looked yep. like I had more costume changes than Cher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I saw the one so, with you and the village people. I saw that one on YouTube. Yeah, that's that one. That one really, that one really yeah. haunts me. That one really comes back. It, it, they said it'll be really cute, and I was just, I always yeah. wanted to be. I was always cooperative. They, you know, they yeah. say, "Hey, it'll be funny if you come on with a tray of pina coladas and order and all like that." Right, and right, right. No, I just I've always been like, okay, if you want me to do that. The the one time I didn't cooperate was I was doing the Merv Griffin show, and they. First thing they did is they handed me a Hawaiian tropical shirt and said, you're going to wear this? And I said, no, I'm not going to wear that. <laughs> I'm not going to wear that. I'm wearing what I'm wearing. Okay. Then they said, okay, and while you're singing, you'll make a pina colada. You'll put, and, and they had a bar with a blender and pineapple juice. And, and I said, I'm, this song isn't even really about pina coladas. It's about, I'm no. not going to make it. And the only thing that bailed me out was that I said, look, and I started singing, and I turned on the blender, and it drowned out my voice. I said, <laughs> I can't make this drink while I'm... So that was, that was the one time I didn't cooperate. Did, did, did you once say you didn't like pina coladas and it tasted like pectate? <laughs> you know, no, what I, what I said, and it was one of those things that if I, could, if I could go back in time, let's go back in time, all of us now, shall we? 40 years, and I'm going to rewrite history. Um, I was... I had a friend who worked on a, a show called The Uncle Floyd Show. Uh, Uncle Nature. Floyd Show, yeah. And, and he asked me to be a guest as a favor to him. And I, again, I'm always, I'm, so I said yes. And he asked me, so do you really like pina coladas? And I said, no, they taste like, to me, they taste like kale, pectate, and pectate. <laughs> which is just, it was just, it was just like saying two gag words. You know, you right, kale, pectate right. always gets a cheap laugh and, and Perrier kind of rounded it out. So for years, people have said, actually, a pina colada doesn't taste anything like kale pectate and Perrier. <laughs> but the one thing I will tell you is that when I wrote this song and sang If You Like Pina Coladas, I had never mm -hmm. actually drunk a pina colada in my life. <laughs> I had never, I had, I had no idea what they tasted like. I just knew it was a, an escape drink, the kind of, if yeah. people were going to want to escape to the islands, that's the kind of drink that you would right. drink to kind of, officially announced, I'm out of here. I've escaped from the humdrum world. I'm on vacation. Um, you know, that, this that, song was a hit. Sorry, go yeah. ahead, Brett. I, I was going to say, that song's very special to me, because I, I was actually a top 40 DJ back in uh, Annapolis, Maryland, and that song came out, and I was on the air. I think it was 1979, and I, I was on the radio from then and through the early 80s in Annapolis. And uh, I played the heck out of that song. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a gr it was well, a great I'm, song, great, great song. Well, thank song. you. I, I love it. I appreciate it. The, what was yeah. amazing about the the record, and I'm sure you had uh, you were implemental in 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 its uh, success, mm -hmm. um, 
was that it was a natural hit record. It, in other yep. words, it, I never saw a record move up the charts in my lifetime that fast, except maybe a Beatles record single. The new, you know, yeah. it went from like eighty to sixty to forty-five. WABC AM in New York, which was the last station ever to play a record, it had to be like number one everywhere else before mm -hmm. ABC would play it. They went on that record when it was like number forty-five on the charts. Uh, just and and people just started uh, responding to it, and I went. I it was like a, I couldn't believe the dream that my life had become because each week the trades would come out, and I had gone from forty-five to thirty-two to twenty-two to sixteen to nine to four to one. That was the last number yep. one record of the nineteen seventies. Uh, it was number one in the nineteen eighties, um, and it, it happens naturally it was just people responding to it but people are also responsible for the parenthesis after the real title the song is called mm -hmm. escape as you know and as it was rising up the charts frantically um the uh promotion men for my label came to me and said we've got a problem which is you called the song escape and everyone is phoning in for that song about the pina coladas exactly and they said they, they said can we change the title from escape to escape parenthesis the Pina Colada song, and right. parenthesis. I said, but that will compromise my artistic integrity. <laughs> and uh, they said, if you don't do it, it's not going to, it won't be a hit. I said, okay, I guess it's the Pina Colada song. And it's a good thing I did. Uh, sometimes I forget that the song was called Escape. I, I, uh, I've, I've told people that I envision my tombstone, and it's in the shape of a giant pineapple. You know, so. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, you know, the song, it, you know, people like, like you said, Escape, The Beach, uh, Tropical Drinks. It's the same thing with Margaritaville with Jimmy Buffett. You know, it's that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that'll last forever. You know, it reminds them of vacation and, you know. And, and that well, song was of, the other. I'm, Go ahead. I'm, I'm kind of teed off with Jimmy Buffett at the moment because uh, <laughs> he's got a show on. I'm the guy that writes for Broadway, but now he, at the moment he's got a show on Broadway. And it's not oh, called okay. Margaritaville. It's called Escape to Margarita. Oh, no. And, uh -oh. yeah, and, well, the, the reason that that annoys me a little bit, and I'm saying this pretty much tongue in cheek, is that years ago when Napster first came out, right. and people were all sharing files, someone labeled their file of Escape the Pina Colada song. They said they made the file name by Jimmy Buffett. They mm -hmm. got confused because of Margarita Bill. And yeah. everyone and his sister's cousin downloaded that file. And mm -hmm. so on half the laptops uh, across the, this great country of ours, people who have illegally downloaded that song not only have it, you know, that they downloaded it uh, off the Internet, uh, right. but it says that Jimmy Buffett sang it. And if you type Pina Colada and Jimmy Buffett, you will find a lot of people very confidently saying <clears> that this was either that this was written by Rupert Holmes and recorded by Jimmy Buffett, or Rupert Holmes wrote Escape, and Jimmy Buffett wrote the Pin Pina Colada song, or mm. Rupert did it first, and then Jimmy Buffett did it. To my knowledge, Jimmy Buffett has never sung the Pina Colada song. Uh, but I, when I next go on a tour, I'm going to sing Mar the hell out of Margarita. <laughs> That's what I <laughs> You should. <laughs> That's funny. And when they, and the audience applauses, I'll say thank you for remembering. Thank you. Thank you. You know, the other thing... Jennifer Tompkins sounds a lot like Jay Giles' band Centerfold. Did anybody ever tell you that? Do you want to know something that's fascinating that you say that? The other day, Centerfold went through my head. And I suddenly thought, why does it sound so familiar? And I thought, wait a second. That's very, very close to Jennifer very Tompkins. Very close. It is. Yeah. What's the what's the statute of limitations <laughs> on a lawsuit? How, well, how you far know, are we? <laughs> I, I just talked to Mark Andes from remember Spirit, you know, and then the lawsuit they had oh, against sure. Led Zeppelin, you know. So that's still going yeah. on. So I I think you're yeah. still in the running. <laughs> I will will we'll have to see. The one that always struck me, uh, and I'm surprised I never read any articles about it. I'm sure they have settled it somehow. Is, right. I mean, I'm a big, big Beach Boys fan. But when I heard Surfing USA, 
Oh, yeah. I said, yeah. that's note for note, Sweet Little Sixteen by Chuck Berry. Yeah, I know. It's not I'm even, surprised, it's not too. Even a ste- it's not even a steal. It's I just know. a new lyric to the old tune. Uh, they they must have worked something out. Some way. Yeah, they, they must have worked something out somewhere. Yeah. You know, uh, the, one that I, um, the one that I find fascinating, and I'm telling this story hearing it third hand, so I'm not, I can't swear to its veracity, but the people who told me were sort of involved in it, so I have to believe them was that, um, and I, I may get the, some of the players wrong, so let's see, I think, so someone's writing the theme from Arthur, and it's, uh, it's, it's Christopher Cross is writing it because mm-hmm. he's going to sing it, and I guess it was Carol Bear Sager and maybe Burt Bacharach who wrote that. Does that sound right to you? Yeah, it sounds about right. Anyway, yeah, yeah. anyway, um, Carol Bear Sager calls her, another person that she writes songs with, uh, which was Peter Allen. And she calls him and says, um, Peter, you know, we're sitting around here writing this, this terrific song that we're writing uh, for Christopher to sing in the movie, Arthur. Um, and you know what? I threw in without thinking um, a, a phrase that you came up with on a song that we were writing together. Um, uh, what's the phrase? Oh, nothing. Just, I think the phrase was, when you get caught between the moon and New York City. Hello, Peter? Peter? <laughs> and uh, so... Now, when you see the record, Peter Allen is uh, listed as one of the writers as well. That right, apparently was, right, right. Was his his phrase from the song. <clears throat> you know, you know the show. Uh, talk about remember W E N N was an incredible show. I, I, you know, I'm a big Thank fan you. of radio as well. I went to broadcasting school for radio television. I like all the mm-hmm. old old time guys like like you did. And I was watching. Yeah. Uh, they're on YouTube. And uh, I was watching with the Victor Comstock sells Betty Roberts on the Magic of Radio. Oh yeah, that was so cool. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that was that is so that neat. was um, that was from the pilot episode, and I, I that speech um, was sort of me talking about what radio could do. Yep, uh, what listening could do. It's pretty much the thing that we talked about at the start of the, or that I talked mm-hmm. about. Sorry about that. Uh, that I talked about at the start of the show. But um, one of my favorite parts of that, and I'm paraphrasing, is he says, he, he lets Betty Roberts, who's the newcomer to radio, he's the guy mm-hmm. who runs the station, and he believes right. that radio is the most boundless theater, uh, the, the, the most unbounded stage in, in the universe. Because you can go anywhere, do anything, be anything, all in an instant. And he says... Um, uh, he says, "What do you listen to this?" And he turns on a broadcast that they are doing at that moment at the station. And I remember it was a, a hero I created called Captain Amazon, mm-hmm. and he and his 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 sidekick Bucky are fighting off the zombie warriors. And he says, um, uh, "He says, what do you think Captain Amazon sounds like?" And Captain Amazon says, "We can't, the free world is counting on us to destroy these zombie warriors." And he sounds very masculine. She says, "I don't know, flowing blonde hair." and uh, uh, granite features and uh, uh, muscles of sinew, and they cut to the actor who's doing it. And, of course, he's a balding guy who's about five foot two, and uh, uh, it looks nothing like what he sounds. And she says, uh, that's what I think he sounds like, uh, what he looks like. And Victor says, that's funny. I thought he looked a lot like me. And, and that's <laughs> yeah. what radio yeah. would do. If, exactly. If, if, if on radio, if if you wanted Lois Lane to be a blonde, <laughs> she's a blonde. Uh, if if uh, I wanted uh, uh, um, a hero to wear glasses because I wear glasses, so be it. Uh, I, uh, that cho- choice was left entirely up to me. I loved the TV series Remember When. Um, I wrote uh, mo- all but maybe one or two of the 56 episodes. I wrote more episodes of that Mm -hmm. TV series than my hero Carl Reiner wrote of the Dick Van Dyke show. Um, It was a dream job. Um, Mm -hmm. I had no one basically to answer to. Uh, AMC, it was their first series. They tried to pretend that that, uh, um, Mad Men was their first, but it wasn't. Uh, remember when was their first series? Different people running this, the network at that time, but it was the first mm-hmm. AMC series. Yeah. And um, uh, when I would get notes from them on the script that I had written for the next, uh, the, they, they would come back with notes on a script I had written. 
And I would have the luxury, Ray, of saying to them, these are, these are wonderful notes. I really, I really, they're so insightful. They're terrific. Unfortunately, we finished filming this episode yesterday. <laughs> and so I had this <laughs> wonderful freedom. They could, I was writing scripts so close to the wire that they never had time to kind of edit them or change them or anything mm-hmm. like that. I developed um, uh, storylines, continuing storylines on the series, and they never knew what they were because I wouldn't tell anyone until like two days, three days before um, the, the uh, episode went before the lens. Um, it had no commercials and it had no laugh track. And that meant I didn't have to tell my story. Uh, I, it meant, I, number one, I had 28 minutes instead of 25 minutes to tell my story. You'd be amazed what those three extra minutes can buy you. Also, I didn't have to have artificial cliffhangers just before you break for commercial. I don't mean necessarily cliffhangers, but that, uh uh-oh, what are they going to do now? And then we go to a a commercial for Gillette Racers. Uh, I I just started telling my story, and it got to progress without interruption until it was done. And and also having no laugh track meant we could move at a much faster pace because there was no need to stop the action a moment while we waited for either the studio audience or a canned audience to laugh. So we could just move through like a movie does and uh, keep our own pace going. So it was a well, our, dream job. For our listening audience, the, the, the set was a fictional Pittsburgh radio station in the late 1930s and early 1940s, um, which was the personal and professional lives of the station staff in the era before and during World War II. And uh, yeah. it, it was an incredible show. You know, I, I always can tell when there's good writing in, in a TV show. You know, and and most of the shows today suck, but th- there are there are some good shows out there with good writing, and you just you just know it. You know, it, every line is is a gem. And, and, and I think you Thank had 56, you. I appreciate that. fifty six episodes, I think, and uh, yep. you had an, an yep. hour long episode for Christmas. Mm-hmm. Um, we did. It was slated for a fifth season, but it was canceled because they had new management, I guess, at AMC. Yeah, the story's kind of. Uh, Heartbreaking. Um, yeah. Every every season, I would, you know, there's. I don't know if you if your listeners know why the Arabian Nights stories are called A Thousand and One Nights. It's based on the idea that there was a, um, and there are different versions of the story, but it was the idea that the stories in the Arabian Nights, things like mm-hmm. Sinbad the Sailor, things like that, were being told by the Princess Scheherazade. Right. Um, and she would tell them in the evening, and she was supposed to be executed the next morning. Uh, the sultan had a habit of executing his wives after he married them each. Uh, so she was slated to be executed the next morning, but she would invent the cliffhanger. And she would leave the story in such a state of suspense that he had no choice but to let her live another day to tell another story. And that's why she ended up telling a thousand and one stories. Um, well, every season I would end with a a huge cliffhanger, and it wasn't a common practice at that time. Now everyone does it. Uh, but I would make sure there was a strong cliffhanger where it would kill you to get through the summer not knowing what had happened. People, I, I had an explosion at the BBC where two of the characters, were. one of them was obviously killed, one survived, and uh, we kept it secret as to which one it was. You only learned at the first episode. A lot of, a lot of different revelations. At the end of the fourth season, I was nervous about whether we would continue. So I left this, I wrote three cliffhangers, three in the one episode, half-hour show, three cliffhangers. And what happened was that new management, as you correctly say, came in. And at that time, AMC only had enough budget to make one uh, very tightly budgeted show. And the fellow who came in as the new head, he could make take no credit for Remember When. Uh, He had nothing to do with it, and everyone knew he had nothing to do with it, and he only had the budget to do one show. And the show was already uh, a critically uh, critically acclaimed series. uh, uh, Entertainment Weekly said it was the best-written show on on, on television, Mm -hmm. and there was no way he could take a bow and say, look what I did. So he canceled us and created a new series, uh, but not with the people that had created Remember When. Right. And it was as if he had, they had taken, sat around and taken 
two of the characters on Remember When and combined them into one character. They called it The Lot. And instead of being, it being about the backstage world of uh, behind the scenes in an old-time radio station, which is what we created, they made it uh, the, uh, the office lives of people on the back lot of a Hollywood studio, except you never saw any movies being made. Right. It was just all in little rooms. And they right. took all the characters we had and tried to create generic versions of those. It lasted about mm. four months, and, uh, and it was dreadful, yeah. and it was everything that Remember When wasn't. Uh, but it was all because one fella had yep. wanted it to something on his resume, and uh, he couldn't take credit for the one show. And it was, by the way, for a cable TV series at that time, it was doing very well in the ratings. Uh, so then the whole AMC changed hands, and they created Mad Men, and then, and then billed that as their first series. But it wasn't. It was actually probably more like their third. Well, we need you back on TV. We need good writers and, and storytellers and you know because there's so much crap on television it's ridiculous <laughs> no. you know um, you really you know, do. I, there's there's a lot of good mystery series coming out of uh, out of uh, England right now that I'm addicted to and yep. uh, those are those good. are good viewing but uh, yeah. and those are very well written too so that's, you know, that's you, always speak, rewarding. speaking of murder mysteries uh, the McMaster's Guide to Homicide Murder Your Employer yeah. uh, where, where is that at right now um, it's uh, funnily enough, uh, Ray. As we speak, it's I'm staring right at it on my uh, on my computer screen, and it's uh -huh. it's uh, it would. Be, uh, the good news is I've written 600 pages. The bad news is it better. I'm going to have to get it down to about 300. So uh, <laughs> yeah, no, uh, no, don't you hate that? It's, it's, <laughs> yeah. It's, well, you know, I remember when, which was a half hour show. My wonderful <laughs> producer Howard Meltzer said, "You've mastered the 42 minute story form." Yeah. <laughs> Which is not, which is not good news if you only have thirty <laughs> minutes to tell a story. Um, yeah. It's it's coming along great. Uh, I'm uh, hoping to wrap it up by the end of. I guess we're s sort of getting by the end of the summer. I hope I, it will be done. It is it is the first in a series of, uh, and I want your listeners to understand that my tongue is planted firmly in cheek as I say this. It is the first <laughs> in a series of self help guides for murderers because they're. Oh, no. such bad, yes, yeah, but it's all tongue in cheek. It's it's about yeah. a wonderful, it's about a wonderful private college uh, that you and I would love to, anyone uh -huh. would love to spend time at. It's a luxurious and sophisticated college in in the 1950s in a secret location. None of the students even know where they are in the world, and it's where people learn to commit. Uh, nobler murders, better murders, and only for people mm -hmm. who really, only uh, uh, where people, the loss of that person would make the world a better place to live. Uh, okay. And uh, and it's all for, it's all in fun, but it's, um, it's sort of uh, how uh, to do in others as you would have others do in you. So um, uh, it, it's, uh, it's quite a, a fun book, and uh, again, as I say, it's uh, coming from Simon and & Schuster, and mm -hmm. with any luck, maybe it'll be out by the spring of 2019. That would be ideal. That would be wonderful. So look for it then. The yeah, Green Master's Guide to Homicide. Volume 1 is called Murder Your Employer because I feel uh, that there are people who will buy the book just to leave it on their desk at work. <laughs> uh, just so that, so that when the boss walks by your desk, they see Murder Your Employer. <laughs> I like yeah, that. So, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, where the truth lies became a motion picture. Uh, Kevin Bacon, uh, Colin Firth, Allison uh, Lohman—they were all in that movie. Uh, yeah. How did you how did you do financially on that? Because when I was talking to Rex Pickett when he did Sideways, uh, he you know he was kind of like sold out that, that they gave him a small amount. I guess he was excited, and, and that was it. And the movie did really well. Another guy who's a local guy here, David Hagberg, did Terminator 3, Rise of the Machines, and he didn't do very well wow. from that really? either. So, yeah. Well, you know, when you're, when you're hired to write, um, like, the third in a series of successful films, right. um, some t or if you're hired by James Patterson to co-write yeah. with him uh, his 173rd novel, you know, <laughs> uh, based on his outline, um, sometimes you don't get a great deal because you're, I'm not saying you're getting a free ride by any chance. You can also screw up the assignment and damage the franchise. 
but right. they've done a lot of work. A lot of the, the work's been done. Um, I will say to you, and I, I don't usually, uh, uh, when uh, Adam McGoyan was uh, an Oscar-nominated director, uh, when he read my first novel, Where the Truth Lies, he read it while I was still in a ring binder. He didn't even read the galleys for the novel. He read it in, in a ring binder. And he wanted to option it. The, uh, the amount he offered was not very high. And someone said, it's not a lot of money. It was good. It was, don't kid yourself, it was money, but it, it wasn't a fortune. Right. And I said, this book isn't even published yet. It's not even a bestseller. Uh, yep. I would pay him the amount he's paying me just to put in it uh, soon to be a major motion picture by right. Adam McGoyan. So when the movie did get made, the deal that had been made for me was pretty good. Good. And good. I had nothing to do. I had nothing to do with the screenplay. Right. Uh, but each day I would look up, and it, I knew that the day they shot the first frame of film for the movie, I would receive um, the largest single check I had ever received in my life. Awesome. Um, I'm glad to hear they that. Shot them, if they shot yeah. the movie. Yeah. And every day for about five months, I would turn to my friends and say, no one called me today to tell me they weren't making the movie. Hmm. And that was the news update. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, another day has gone by, and no one has said they're not making the movie. There, there, was, there was a date slated for when they would film it, and I kept saying, we're now a month away, and no one has canceled. Yeah. And that day came, and I thought, did they, make, did they start shooting? Because once they could abandon on the second day of shooting, they'd still have to pay me a certain, a certain amount. And uh, it turned out well. Unfortunately, um, some aspects of the movie were, were true to the novel. Uh, other aspects were really different. It's a very different yep. tone. The most important character in the story, uh, Alison Lohman's character, um, mm -hmm. was just as far in tone from what I had written as you could possibly have. And they, by the way, they changed the ending. You know, they once, someone once turned to Ernest Hemingway and said, Do you, uh, is, are there many differences between your novel and the movie of your novel? And Ernest Hemingway said, no, not at all. Uh, he said, in, in my novel, the hero dies, and in the movie, he lives. But other than that, there's hardly any difference whatsoever. Um, so <laughs> um, it, someone once said to James M. Cain, who wrote the novels, The Postman Always Rings Twice, right. Double Indemnity, Mildred Pierce, they said, what do you feel about what Hollywood has done to your novels? And he said, Hollywood's done, Hollywood's done nothing to my novels. They're right there on the shelf, right there. You can read them anytime you want. Uh, so I'm hoping, I, I do think that I, I'm a great fan of Kevin Bacon, mm -hmm. uh, and he did a, a, a heroic job in the role, although it, the, the role as written was not supposed to be Kevin Bacon. And Colin Firth was both amazing as an actor and just the most gracious human being. He, mm -hmm. he inscribed my book. He said, I think this is going to be a case of me having novel envy. Uh, that he didn't get to play the character as fully written in the book. Yeah. So they were wonderful, and they did great jobs with it. But it wasn't right. a huge success. So I, I did not make a fortune from the uh, residuals of that movie. Right. Uh, right. And they didn't have me write the music either. So that, that, that was, uh, that was um, it, certainly not to be expected, but that would have been another source of income. But the day they started shooting it, I did do um, very well. And I, and, and I was Good. very pleased and grateful. Good, good. That's good to hear. Roper, here's your, la here's your last question, then we got to kind of wrap it up here. Uh, sure. He here's, a, here's a question I ask everybody, and I get some really interesting a answers. If you had a Field of Dreams wish, you know, like the movie, uh, to perform, collaborate with anyone from the past or present, who would that be? Wow. If I could have, if I could perform or collaborate, if I could... I think in this yep. case it would be collaborate. I think we would okay. be talking about collaborating. Um, I think I would like to have written with the people who wrote Happy Birthday to You. I understand the income on that on that song <laughs> has been really great. No, I look, I have great heroes, um, and a couple of them artistically I would never want to collaborate with because I like what they do all on their own. Right, um, right. Paul, Paul, Paul McCartney was very, very gracious to me once mm -hmm. in my life uh, and told me with a straight face that he was a fan of my work. When he told me, I went, um, 
yeah, right. And then I thought, gee, the first words I ever said to Paul McCartney were, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, but it, uh, but his wife, uh, Linda McCartney, at that time, uh, actually yeah. made it clear that he did listen to myself and liked it. Um, for good reason, one of my cuts on the uh, Songs That Sound Like Movies uh, collection mm-hmm. is called I Don't Want to Hold Your Hand. Uh, yeah. But um, And incorporated a lot of Beatles riffs. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, I have heroes, many of whom you would never have heard of. Uh, mm-hmm. There's a, uh, an amazing mystery writer who's one of the most humane writers since Charles Dickens, named G.K. Chesterton, who wrote the Father Brown stories. I would yep. love to have gotten to know him. I got to spend some time getting to know Orson Welles. That was slightly amazing in my really? life. Really? Wow. Um, that's, yeah. that's huge. I'm trying to... Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I once yeah. asked him if he used to wear all the, these huge... He was quite large towards the end of his life, mm-hmm. and he wore these huge black on black on black shirts, coats, jackets, capes. And I said, do you design your own clothing? He said, that would be like having an architect for a tent. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, he's a funny guy. But, you know, I, 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 yes. I, I, um, I had the chance to meet John Lennon once, and I passed, right. because I thought there's no way he can ever be, if he does one thing that makes me think that he's, like, either looking down his... I didn't want to ruin my love of his work by, by getting right. to know him. I, I was Same thing with Cary Grant. I had a chance to meet Cary Grant uh, mm-hmm. while he was still alive, and, and I thought he, could, he will never be the Cary Grant that I know, and I don't want to, I don't want to ruin that. I, I have to tell you, um, you've had some very fascinating answers from people. Um, I, I don't know the people that I would have loved to have collaborated with. I wouldn't want to mess up what they were doing. <laughs> Right. I, right. Uh, I, 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 there, I, there are some, there are some lyricists. I'll tell you this. Uh, the, the Rogers and Hart. Before there was Rogers and Hammerstein, mm-hmm. there was uh, Rogers. There was Rogers and Hart. Lorenz Hart. I would have loved yeah. to write some songs with Lorenz Hart. Mm-hmm. And um, I, 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 I kind of love the people that I love the way they are, and I like doing what I do. I don't collaborate very often, you know. Uh, I usually write my first musical for Broadway. Uh, I wrote the book, the mm-hmm. music, the lyrics, and the orchestrations, Mystery of Edwin Drood. Uh, but I got to collaborate with Dickens. I think I like it when uh, I get to collaborate with people who are dead and can't talk back and change <laughs> their minds. I, I wrote yeah. the music for um, Twelfth Night in Central Park. Yep. Um, and uh, the lyrics were by a fellow named Bill Shakespeare. And... Uh, William Shakespeare, and I wrote with him, and uh, he never once suggested I make any changes to the melody. So that's sort of an ideal collaboration, I guess. That, 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 that's a great answer, actually. That's a very, very good answer. Yeah. I, I'm like, why you know, I got to... Why dilute the... Go ahead. I, I got to meet some of my heroes, too. Like, uh, uh, I had a client... We used to have electronic stores in, in D.C., on F Street, and a lot of people used to walk in, and they used to be clients of ours. As a matter of fact, I want to send you my book. It's all about growing up in the family business. I, should I send that to? Uh, is it to, to, to Teresa Jenkins? Janine? Sure, that would be gr- that would be great. That would be great. Do you say your name Teresa or is it Teresa? It's it rhymes with Vanessa. It's Teresa. Okay, ter- Teresa. Teresa yes. Jennings, who, who arranged this interview, and I want to thank her very very much. I'll, I'll thank her properly after after we conclude. But I'm going to send sure. her a copy of my book to you because I think you'll get a kick out of it. And what's, it, it, what it, is the title of the book, please? It's called Check the G's. And a G is a slang word for a customer, or we used it for a lot of other different things. And uh, once you read it, you'll, you'll, you'll figure it out. Is it, is it a little bit about the – is it a bit, a bit about the – and I, I mean this only in the most positive sense – the shell game that goes on between the seller and the buyer. To some yeah, degree. yes, it is. It is kind of like that. You're right. My my dad was a. Uh, his family were Syrian Jews, and they used to call them SYs. And you used to see a, a a string of those stores. <laughs> you being from New York, I'm sure you saw a lot of those electronic stores in DC oh, back in the 60s and 70s. Yeah. And, and it's and, it's yeah. funny. All of all of them, all of those electronic stores, said in the window. Going out of business, lost our lease, everything must go. <laughs> and ten years later, I would come back and say, "When are you guys vacating the premise again?" I saw one guy. He's standing with his son outside a store, and it says, "Lost our lease, everything must go." Yep. Closing sale, 
And he turned to his son and said, someday all this will be yours. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was us. <laughs> we well, we did know, the my, same version my, in, in Washington. <laughs> my grandfather came to this country and uh, had a dry goods store in the town of Niagara, yep. New York. I never got to meet him. He died before I was born. But he came to this country, and I had been told stories about the code. It was a family business, so everyone right. selling things was in the family. And my father would tell me about the elaborate code that would be written on the so just as some serial numbers and letters that would mm -hmm. be on the box that told you what the real price was. <laughs> and when you just, and when you said, you know, for you, he'd always say, you know, for you, and you'd say, well, I met you 15 that's right. seconds ago. Why for me? Why for me? But that's nice, man. Morris, Morris, that's nice, man. Hop off for every, anything in the store. Hop off. And, um... And, uh, Rupert, you uh, already know the book, man. <laughs> you already got it. You're, you're right on. <laughs> well, I look so forward funny. to reading it. For your oh, listeners, man. Can we say the title again? For your listeners' benefit, can we say the title one more time? Check the G's. Check it's, the G's. Uh, the, I will check the G's. True story of an eclectic American family and their wacky family business. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the you, family you'll businesses like it. were wonderful. That was a wonderful oh, they were. thing. It was a wonderful thing. They're, they're, they're all, my, a lot uh, of them my, are gone now. My, grand, yep. my grandfather, my, apparently my grandfather would measure yards of fabric that you would buy uh -huh. by holding yep. the bolt up to his nose and then extending the fabric out to the length of his arm. <laughs> and, it, and he'd say, okay, so that's one yard, two yards. Turned out that he had a 28-inch reach. And then he always, at the very end, he'd say, I'll throw in a little extra for you. Which, and the little extra that he was throwing in was bringing him just barely below the accurate count. You know, so. <laughs> Great stuff. We, Their slogan, we have sto the, slogan of, the slogan of the store was, if it's not in the window, we don't sell it. <laughs> we don't sell it, yeah. <laughs> Great stuff, huh? That, that was the old days. We don't have it. Yeah. You, well, you're going to yeah. enjoy it. I, I promise you. You'll love it. <laughs> I'm sure I will. I'm sure I will. Rupert, thank you, man, so much for being on the show today. You're an incredible uh, artist. Uh, you've done just about everything. Keep keep it up. Uh, we want a lot more Rupert Holmes out there. We, we need guys like you uh, desperately. Uh, okay. Thank you for the incredible music that you've given us and uh, continue to bring. And, and please, come to Florida. <laughs> I, I actually uh, will probably be in Florida because I try to encourage productions of my plays and musicals in Florida in the right. months of January, February, and March. Okay. And uh, uh, I know that there's uh, definitely a big production of The Mystery of Edwin Drood in Orlando right. uh, in January. And I feel... I feel like they deserve my company. I need to, even though I'm not involved in these productions, I think I should do the noble thing and go to Florida in January. Even though I love the slush and the cold and the bitterness and the darkness of New York in the winter, uh, maybe I'll be a, a good Samaritan and head down to, to Florida in, in, in January. So maybe I'll see you then, okay? That would be great. That would be wonderful. Thank you so much, Rupert. <laughs> you take care. Bye for now. All right, you too. Thank you so much. For more information about Rupert Holmes, visit www.ruperthomes.com. Purchase Rupert Holmes' latest box set, Songs That Sound Like Movies. Five stars, baby. Available at Cherry Red Records and also at Amazon.com. And Rupert's latest novels, Swing and Where the Truth Lies. And coming soon, uh, The McMaster's Guide to Homicide, Murder Your Employer. Also, uh, all books can be found at Amazon.com, and also look for that very latest book, The McMaster's Guide to Homicide, Murder Your Employer. I'm sure that'll also be on Amazon.com. Very special thanks to Teresa Jennings, or Teresa Jennings, as you say in my Spanish Cuban roots, for arranging this interview with Rupert Holmes, and of course the dynamic duo of Doug and Don Newsom of VBS Radio for making the magic happen. Each and every broadcast of the Ray Shasho Show. If you have comments or suggestions for the show, contact me at the Ray Shasho Show at gmail.com. Don't forget to purchase a copy of my book entitled Check the G's, The True Story of an Eclectic American Family and the Wacky Family Business, or the second edition entitled Wacky Shenanigans on F Street, Proud to be Politically Incorrect, in Washington, D.C., available now at Amazon.com. I promise you will live it. Have a great week, everybody.
Thank you, everybody, for listening to the Ray Shasho Show, brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency. Call 941-877-1552 or visit us at publicityworksagency.com, specializing in author and music artist publicity plans. We shine when we make you shine. Join Ray Shasho every Monday at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern on... PBS Radio, Station One.